Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is Matt Barreto, the uh, faculty director of the UCLA Voting Rights Project. I'm also a professor of political science and Chicano studies. Thank you for registering and attending our webinar today as part of the Luskin Summit. Uh, our webinar today is titled Protecting Democracy, Implementing Equal and Safe Access to the Ballot Box During a Global Pandemic. Uh, this is not a project we had planned a year ago. I think when we initially submitted this uh, project, we had some different ideas in mind, but of course times have changed and now uh, we are all using our best research, legal training, and um, practices to really tackle what is confronting our democracy today. And that is how can we keep everyone safe? How can we keep our elections secure? And how can we make sure that people can still participate fully in our democracy uh, perhaps by using expanded access to vote by mail. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And um, before I get to the specific panelists who are going to be participating, we're going to be watching a short um, video that came from a webinar that we hosted a few weeks ago with the Secretary of State of California, Alex Padilla, who has been at the forefront of this uh, process, uh, securing access to vote by mail in California. So. Um, let me go ahead and get that video queued up, uh, share that video with you after the video is over. You'll hear remarks on the video from Secretary of State Alex Padilla, uh, Neil Kelly, who is the um, Registrar of Voters in Orange County, just south, uh, Pam Carlin, uh, one of the most preeminent constitutional law professors uh, up the state there in Stanford. You'll also hear from Sonia Diaz, who is the founding director of the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. Um, I moderated the discussion. And then my co-director of the Voting Rights Project, Chad Dunn, uh, a voting rights and civil rights attorney who's going to be joining us afterwards. So let's go ahead and watch this, hear these remarks, and then we'll return to you in just a moment to answer some more questions and have a discussion about how we can vote in the time of this. Please enjoy the video. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Sonia Diaz, and I am the founding director of UCLA's Latino Policy and Politics Initiative. We're here with an esteemed panel of subject matter experts and practitioners to talk about universal vote by mail um, in the context of COVID-19. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Matt Barreto. All right. Thank you, Sonia, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, we're really pleased to be hosting this conversation today. As you know, there has been a, a substantial increase in interest in how to protect our democracy amidst this pandemic. Uh, ideas of uh, moving to universal vote by mail, securing uh, mail ballots, as well as how do we vote in person in a safe and healthy manner. These are just some of the questions that our expert panel is going to be discussing with you today. Uh, there's a belief among many that this is one wave of this virus and then it will dissipate and life will return to normal. But one of the things that we discovered from the medical literature and, and consulting with experts is that uh, is that these pandemics tip into typically happen in multiple waves. We're experiencing the first one now. There'll be another uh, in all likelihood behind it. And most of the literature we looked at showed that that next wave would be starting in October, November of next year when the general election started. So with that information, we wanted to envision uh, what were the best methods to employ in voting in this kind of environment. And as you mentioned, we put out a report. It's at uclavrp.org, but it lays out uh, sort of a two-step process. What should voting look like uh, in the future when we have more time to plan, uh, like Registrar Kelly and, and the Secretary of State uh, have been able to do in California? And then what must we do immediately to ensure that there are uh, measures in place that allow everyone to vote? We can't cancel our democracy. I think I even saw uh, Leader Mitchell, Mitch McConnell say this morning that we voted in World War I, we voted in the Great Depression, we voted in the Civil War, we're going to vote this year, so how do we make that happen? And in terms of what is accomplishable in the short term is the first is that all jurisdictions need to make available, no excuse, vote by mail. Uh, many jurisdictions that already allow vote by mail do so only if there are uh, particular uh, circumstances. Often it's people over a certain age or people who, who have a disability or some other personal condition. The first step is, at least for this next six, seven months of elections, 
we're going to have to have no excuse vote by mail. We have to take the burden off of in-person voting. Uh, importantly, as part of that, uh, the postage uh, for this mail process has to be included. People uh, always have the barrier of financial cost to vote. Uh, to many people, even getting a stamp is a burden. But importantly, uh, folks who can afford stamps often can't get them. There's not a way to get postage at home during social distancing. There's all types of barriers for all people. So the postage part of the problem has to be uh, resolved. We think and we recommend in our report that states and jurisdictions should mail a report to every registered voter. Uh, unless that's uh, mandated by Congress, then there are going to have to be some alternatives uh, because some jurisdictions are gonna refuse to uh, mail it to all registered voters. So in that case, if there is an option to request, it should be uh, as burdenless as possible. Uh, people uh, should be able to request by phone. They should be able to request their mail ballot uh, through a website. Uh, and certainly they ought to be able to mail in a request. And it's an all of the above strategy uh, uh, on that point. Another thing is staffing. Uh, for those of us who work in elections, uh, we realize that most of the staff is over the age of 65 in many areas. Uh, a lot of those folks are precisely the people that shouldn't be out and about right now. And uh, so jurisdictions need to prepare for that. What we recommend in our report is that local, county, city, state employees who are otherwise not emergency employees uh, should be designated now as backup elections. Yeah. So uh, do I think it's doable to uh, significantly grow vote by mail across the country? Absolutely. In fact, I think fundamentally, we need to get to a point where every voter in America has uh, an opportunity for no excuse vote by mail in every election. So first comes the willingness, first comes the vision, first comes you know, the leadership and the belief that this is essential uh, in a health pandemic or not in a health pandemic, but especially during a health pandemic. And this is something that we can't wait until October to try to start accomplishing. So that people are less confident in the election system than they have been in decades past. And that would have been true even if we didn't have uh, COVID-19. What COVID-19 has added to this is um, it's put stress on a system that's already organized in uh, a way that's difficult to manage, which is huge parts of uh, the election process are devolved down to the 3,100 county level uh, governments in the United States, people like Registrar Kelly. Uh, because so many more people will be voting by mail, and I'll leave the discussions of the details uh, to experts like the Secretary of State and, uh, and the Registrar, but because of that, one of the things that's likely to happen, and I think it's something that the media needs to prepare people for, is we are not likely to know on election night what the results are. That is, people have gotten used to the idea that, you know, the polls close at 8 p.m. and at 8.02, uh, the maps change color on national TV. And if you have a lot of people voting by mail, even if they're required to have the ballots postmarked ahead of election day, and in some states they are, and in other states they're not, um, by the time those ballots get counted, uh, by the time signatures get verified in states with signature verification and like, it's not going to be, it's not going to be, uh, the, the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. It's likely to be quite a bit later that week. And it's really important that people not assume anything about exit polls or polling data, you know, public opinion polls, uh, about what the results of an election are going to be, either nationwide or for some of the local elections. Thanks. But the voters reacted. And the voters reacted in a big way. When you look at the March primary numbers uh, from just a few weeks ago, we had about 82% of our voters in the total turnout, which was the highest, by the way, since 2000, that used a vote by mail ballot. Compare that to just a few years ago, which was about 30 points lower. So voters will adapt. Voters will accept this. And voters are looking for that opportunity for not only expanded uh, access, but more, more, a better experience for the voters. And I, I don't know if it was fortuitous for us to have this infrastructure in place based on this pandemic, but there are certainly things counties can do in the short term to ramp up and get ready for a November election potentially that could be mostly vote by mail. So you're right, voting by mail, 
uh, is smart from a voting rights standpoint, a public health standpoint, but it's only as effective as we educate the public and we recognize that it's not just California, it's not just Texas, the whole country is very, very diverse and we need to communicate to voters in the diversity uh, of languages that make up our beautiful country. So one of the things I think that we're trying to do with vote by mail is uh, if you think about in-person voting, it's a little bit like those ventilators that people are talking about. You can't overwhelm it with people, but there are going to be people who need it. Uh, and so some of this is trying to flatten the curve of voting by having people vote early or have people vote by mail or dropping off their ballots so that those people who actually do need assistance in casting a ballot for whatever reason uh, can get that assistance uh, either through early voting or on election day itself because there are a lot of people who are in uh, that kind of position. The, the you know, uh, we gotta be precise when we're talking about this stuff because most people will, he will say or hear universal vote by mail and it will be interpreted as vote by mail only. But right? it's important to distinguish, number one, how voters receive their ballot. We're talking for, and, and advocating for every voter to be able to receive their ballot in the mail without an excuse. The second part of the process is how the ballot gets returned, right? And uh, as Neil can explain, there's multiple ways for people to return the ballot. You can return it by mail. So one specific thing that we can do uh, to just make sure there's no excuses, no impediments is for states and counties to cover the return postage, right? The last thing you want is somebody's voting rights, you know, being sacrificed for scrambling for a stamp, right? Can't go to the, the post office anymore. Uh, uh, and number two, in Orange County and many other places, local jurisdictions uh, install ballot drop boxes throughout the region. So it's kind of like a mailbox, but clearly for ballots only. Uh, and any voter can drop it off at any drop box in their county, convenient to them. But there's still a need and an important role for that in-person experience that we've been talking about. For people who prefer it, I think that's their right. For people who need assistance, language or otherwise, it's also uh, it's it's also how same day registration works. By the way, uh, so uh, we don't want to disenfranchise somebody who's eligible simply because they didn't register so far in advance. So we need to maintain that in person option only. Yeah, I think uh, you know the secretary mentioned it. You want to make sure there's that good outreach. We have not just in the Latino community, but in the Asian American community, record numbers of first time voters, uh, people who are becoming naturalized citizens, people who are turning 18. These electorates are growing very dramatically. And as we think of new voting methods, we need to make sure we're doing that outreach. This is something that civic groups, organizations can be involved in, but you have to have leadership from the top. And so you have to have that outreach coming from either your secretary of state or your county, registrar or county clerk. There needs to be information sent out. They have a list, everybody, everybody who is registered to vote. They need to be doing that outreach. And we're lucky here in California, uh, as well as other states on the West Coast, like Oregon and Washington, other states like Colorado, they're doing these sorts of efforts. They're doing that outreach. It's not uh, rocket science. It's not impossible. You have those lists of voters. Let's inform the voters so that they have a chance to be heard. And I think a little bit of extra attention needs to be heard to those first time registrants. When someone comes on the voter registration roll for the first time, let's celebrate that. Let's engage them, uh, especially as we're moving to a new um, method, perhaps, of uh, vote by mail. So the more outreach, the better. And I think you have a lot of good examples in some of the Western states. Yeah, we're talking about vote by mail for a reason. We are living in unprecedented times as it pertains to public health and public health risks. But if we step back and look at the history of our country, Americans have gone to the polls in times of peace, in times of war, in good economic times, in times of economic recession, and yes, even during prior flu pandemics, right? So we've got to look first and foremost at the resiliency of our democracy. And while, you know, we're in the middle of the presidential primary election season uh, and some states are postponing their elections or changing how they're going to conduct the primary election when it comes to the november election it is not a matter of if and it is not a matter of when because we have a date tuesday november 3rd is general election day 
in America. The question is how we will provide the opportunity for people to vote because we must and we will, but do so in a way that preserves voting rights and access to the ballot, election security, and public health. And it's through, through these measures, through these models that we've seen be effective in many states, like vote by mail, that we can do that. But it's you know not just looking at vote by mail, and I may or may not be comfortable, let's put it in the context of history, and let's put it in the context of today. Come November, we hope and pray that we have flattened the curve and the pandemic is well behind us, but there is no guarantee. So as elections officials, we can hope for the best, but we've got to prepare for the worst. How do we maintain the November election in a way that's accessible, but safe and healthy for everybody? I believe vote by mail is a core element of how we could and should prepare, but we can't wait till October to do it. We need to start planning and preparing now. I have a question for the lawyers on, on this panel. So if Congress doesn't act and does not act in the way that previous Congresses have, either during recessions, during war, during pandemics, is there an equal protection claim under the 14th Amendment around voting by mail? So the answer to that is, um, like almost everything in the law, it depends. Um, and so there are two kinds of claims that could be brought. One is a kind of classic, uh, you are depriving me of my right to vote. And that would be true in states that have some form of vote by mail that a person doesn't qualify for. Uh, so for example, um, in a state where uh, the definition of illness or the definition of disability that the state uses doesn't allow you to say, I'm staying home not because I'm already uh, testing positive for the coronavirus, but because I'm afraid I'll catch the coronavirus if I go to the polls. Um, those people, I think, have a potential claim uh, under what's called substantive equal protection, but it's really kind of halfway between equal protection and the fundamental rights strand of federal uh, law. Then there are two other kinds of claims that you may see uh, that we haven't seen much of in the past, but I could imagine here. One of them is uh, there, there are several states that allow for no excuses uh, vote by mail for people over the age of 65. But for people under the age of 65, either don't allow for that at all or require them to produce IDs that older people don't have to produce. Um, the 26th Amendment to the Constitution, which really hasn't been litigated hardly at all, um, provides that states cannot discriminate, deny, or abridge the right to vote uh, on account of someone's age once that person has turned 18. And the question whether treating voters over the age of 65 differently from voters under the age of 65, in a t in particularly in a time of pandemic, um, that's a very real question, especially if, for example, you have a state that says people over the age of 60 should stay home. So you have people who are under 65, but over the age that the state is telling them not to go out and therefore not to go to the polls, well, that might be a 26th Amendment question. The important point is, we're not going to cancel our democracy. We are so thankful to Secretary Padilla and Registrar Kelly for their leadership and what they've done in California and, and the model they provide to the rest of us. And now as we adjourn this call, it's on all of us to double our commitment to democracy and find a way to make this work in all 50 states and territories. And if you have any final uh, questions or comments, as I said, do not uh, hesitate to reach out the way that you registered and signed up for this webinar. You can reach all of the experts that are here uh, we'll be happy to answer additional follow-up uh, questions and interviews. And we thank you again for your commitment to protecting our democracy this year. But as you heard from Secretary Padilla, we have an opportunity to protect it during this pandemic. But this is something that all states should be doing to encourage additional voter participation and engagement. We should be enacting these measures everywhere, every year, to make sure that all voters have a right to vote in the manner that they think uh, is most appropriate. All right, welcome back. Uh, I hope you enjoyed those uh, brief segments from the webinar. Um, if you were interested in seeing the full hour long session and that discussion with Secretary Padilla, you can find that on the UCLA Latino Policy and Politics website. We have a full link uh, there under the Voting Rights uh, Division to find the full webinar. I'm now gonna return and introduce the panelists that are with me today. We're gonna unpack some of those topics that were discussed 
in the webinar um, and we're going to then take your questions. So if you have questions, you can also start populating uh, the Q&A box and we will uh, take those questions and answer them to the best of our abilities. If not, I refer you to where you can find follow-up information. So let me now go ahead and introduce my two uh, panelists who are gonna be joining me today. Um, we're gonna be joined uh, today by uh, Chad Gunn, who is the Director of Litigation at the UCLA Voting Rights Project. You saw Chad uh, a bit on that last uh, video talking about some of the claims uh, related to vote by mail. Uh, we're also joined by Sunny Wacknan, who is a, a Voting Rights uh, Law Policy Fellow. Uh, she is a 3L finishing up her uh, law school just finished up her law school and will be joining us full-time uh, as a full-time employee here at the UCLA Voting Rights uh, Project. Uh, Sunny will be leading and coordinating all of our uh, legal and policy research, including the litigation that we're doing here. Uh, and both Sunny and Chad have been um, very engaged in these efforts already. We're going to talk to them about some of their experiences. I want to start with you, uh, Sunny, if I could. And um, if you could just sort of tell us, how did this get started? Um, the UCLA Voting Rights Project had been working on lots of other issues related to voter suppression and access to the ballot box. Um, but how did uh, the team and your uh, efforts in this get started to, to, to take us on this road to vote by mail? And uh, what is the UCLA uh, team at Luskin doing right now? So the way we started was realizing first that there would be a crisis for voting come 2020 and come the primaries because of COVID-19, especially as governors started to issue stay-at-home orders and we saw the possibility that states were going to um, either cancel their primary or push back their primaries, especially in early on in Ohio and Wisconsin. And so I, not only a team of law students, but also public policy students, PhD students and undergrads, and be able to litigate these cases or where do we see the state trying to um, circumvent policies that we think are, are the best policies and how do we create you know, laws that don't let them wiggle out of the, or find loopholes, whereas public policy students and PhDs are gonna look at the academic literature. So that's really where we got started with this, first realizing that there would be a crisis and then jumping into action on creating a policy paper. What are the best practices that we saw, not only from the academic research, but from a legal standpoint and uh, moving forward, how do we ensure that everyone's able to access the ballot box during this pandemic? And I think that first paper, I want to come back to you and get uh, a little overview, but I think that first paper was put out pretty quickly. That was March 23rd that that first policy paper was put out. Yes, it was. And uh, Sunny has been directly involved in discussions with um, members of Congress and their staff on how to possibly write some of that into legislation. I'm going to come back uh, to you, Sunny, and talk about that. But now let me introduce uh, Chad Dunn, who you saw a little bit in the video as well. Uh, Chad is actually taking a break from a federal trial right now. Uh, joining us, uh, he has been involved in as part of the litigation team in Florida on the Jones versus DeSantis trial on the felon reenfranchisement uh, that you've probably been reading about. Uh, Chad, if you could give us a short summary of that, but then I really want to finish uh, and talk about your expertise and involvement in the Texas vote by mail trial, the first one uh, that we've seen. But tell us what's happening in Florida right now. And, and thank you for, for breaking to participants for being here. So as you mentioned in Florida, there's a federal trial going on by by electronic the state effort had passed an initiative allowing people who had completed their sentences to register and vote. Uh, the state legislature passed a bill people come from and so the court the court entered an injunction against this practice of people essentially to pay money to vote now uh on the vote by mail uh, efforts, we also have uh, filed a lawsuit in Texas. 
uh, and Texas has is one of these states you just learned in that webinar there that limits vote by mail to people uh, that have certain conditions. Generally, it's people over the age of 65, military and overseas voters, people who are going to be out of their county uh, during in-person voting, and then also people with the disability, which state law defines as a physical injury or condition uh, that may give them a likelihood to vote if they vote in person. So the first step uh, in that case was to file a case in state court and ask the state courts to clarify, just as a matter of state law, uh, whether or not disability or physical injury or uh, physical condition, as the statute calls it, is something uh, that also covers people who are social distancing to protect themselves or others during this pandemic. We had an evidentiary hearing. It was broadcast live and uh, hundreds of people participated or watched around the country. And ultimately, the state district judge issued an order saying that voters in Texas uh, who were social distancing for COVID-19 could, in fact, check disability and vote by mail. But as the judge was announcing his ruling in that regard, the secretary, uh, excuse me, the attorney general of the state in uh, a brazen act of sort of defiance of its own state judiciary, issued a letter uh, prosecutor threatening, threatening to prosecute organizations who complied with the judge's ruling. So now there's also a federal case uh, that has begun. Uh, we have filed one. And uh, also just yesterday, the National Redistricting uh, Commission filed one, uh, or committee filed one. And to the state is essentially trying to prosecute people for doing what the judicial branch has so far ordered. So let me interrupt really quick, Chad, if you could just unpack this a little bit. The trial that you uh, litigated just a few weeks ago was in state court, in Texas state court. Is that right? That's right. And a judge uh, in the, that represented uh, the entire state of Texas, or was it just Travis County where Austin is? Well, they're a state district judge, so they're, they're, they're a state office holder from that standpoint, like a federal judge in, in Houston is a federal judge of the United States, but they had jurisdiction over the Austin area. And, and they issued a ruling uh, that said, because of this disability exemption in the state of Texas, anyone could check that box. And according to this Texas state judge, anyone should be able to request an absentee ballot. And that was supposed to take effect for anyone in the whole state of Texas for your upcoming primary runoff? Exactly. I mean, with, with one exception, if, if you had some proven immunity to it, which, you know, to my knowledge, nobody, nobody yet has, uh, but then you wouldn't qualify under that circumstances. But for anybody else, which from my understanding is still everybody else, that's right. And then after the state, so this was supposed to be holding for the entire state of Texas. After the state uh, judge issued this, then your attorney general of the state of Texas intervened and said that according to their interpretation, they would prosecute people who tried to request an absentee ballot. Is that the current state of what's happening right now? Well, it's, it's actually a little worse than that. It's not that the state intervened. The state was already in the lawsuit and the judge had essentially ruled against the state's position. Uh, and all the arguments that they would ultimately reduce to a letter, the judge rejected. Uh, and, and then the executive branch through the attorney general's office sends out a letter saying they're gonna prosecute people for doing what the judge had ordered. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Normally what you would expect, I mean, look, it happens all the time, judges rule against government positions. You appeal, you announce to the media that you think that this decision's wrong, and then you work expeditiously to get it reversed. Instead, what the state did is just say, we're not gonna follow it and told citizens you know, and threaten citizens for possible prosecution if they and, did follow the judge. And this is why now uh, you you have uh, sought relief from the federal courts to to sort of settle this dispute in the state of Texas. Exactly. Okay. Well, we'll uh, we'll come back and talk a little bit about some of the claims in that. I want to get back uh, to Sonny and ask about um, the Twenty Sixth Amendment in particular. That was one of the issues Chad mentioned just in the state of Texas that people over the age of sixty five. Um, had an opportunity to vote no excuse by, by absentee ballot in the state of Texas, and that uh, perhaps for people under uh, who were younger, um, this was discriminating against them. You've just um, worked with a research team at Harvard and other places to, to bring together um, uh, some of the best knowledge and practices, some of the legal claims. What do we know about the 26th Amendment? What are the possible claims that can be made to extend uh, the right to vote to people under the age of 65 in some of these states? So we, as Professor Carlin has said um, in the webinar, that there's 
third little little litigation that has happened around the 26th Amendment, which leaves us with no legal test to figure out how we are going to bring these claims. Um, lawyers and courts love tests. They love, and um, for the 26th Amendment, there's a variety of tests that we could we could bring about. The one that we're advocating for is this thing called strict scrutiny, which means that the government must have a compelling reason to have to discriminate on the basis of age. And not only is that reason compelling, but it's narrowly tailored to ensure that you're not taking too many people, you're not discriminating against too many people or too little people. So in the paper, we go through the history of the 26th Amendment, how the 26th Amendment follows the language of the 15th Amendment to ensure that people are not able to just access the ballot because of their age, but are able to participate in voting because of their age. And so a lot of these laws are what we call prima facie discriminatory. On its face, they discriminate. They say 65 and older, you're good to go. You can have an absentee ballot. Under 65, you have to have other reasons. And so it creates two classes of voters. And it is our position that for these states, they don't have a compelling reason, especially in light of COVID-19, to discriminate against voters based on their age and say who can and cannot get an absentee ballot. All right, great. Well, we'll let's um, look forward to that. And uh, we have another uh, question that was one that I was thinking about, and it came in from the audience. So I'm going to throw that uh, to you as well. And if you could also uh, let folks know uh, where they can find some of this information. But the question that came in uh, related to other research that I know that you've been involved in is what about some of the claims uh, related to vote by mail and election security? Uh, we know we had this uh, election ballot harvesting uh, scandal in North Carolina. There have been a lot of claims of that. Uh, this is something that you and some of the other uh, legal fellows and PhD students at the Voting Rights Project have dug into. What do we know about uh, voter fraud and vote by mail? So on April 14th, actually, we published a paper that's on our website called Debunking the Myth of Voter Fraud and Mail Ballots. And um, we know generally that it's they're more likely to get hit by lightning than to have someone impersonate you at the polls. Um, I'm not sure if maybe Chad has a better Texasism than um, <laughs> the phrase getting hit, uh, more likely to get hit by lightning, but that Voter fraud is especially rare in the United States, and it's even rarer in vote by mail states. And we see in states like Washington, Oregon, Hawaii, Colorado, and um, even in states that have substantial vote by mail components, such as California and Arizona, that we're not having widespread voter fraud because of vote by mail. There's, you don't hear every single election that someone is trying to defraud people through the mail, especially in states where you can only really vote by mail, um, as I said, Washington and Oregon and Hawaii. And so we know that these, that vote by mail and voter fraud is extremely rare. And we want to ensure that voters feel safe, that when they vote, they're able to track their ballot, that they're able to know that their ballot was received and their ballot was counted and that the system is equitable. But in reality, the fraud concern is one that maybe it's fun to talk about because it might seem salacious, but it's not happening um, widespread. And it, when people make mistakes on vote by mail ballots, they're, they're that, just that, they're, they're mistakes. I think uh, in looking at that uh, report, and let me just um, mention a couple of people last, thank you, Andrew, for that question. Uh, from the audience. Also, Eileen had that uh, similar question. You can find all of this information if you go to uclavrp.org. Um, and if you go to that website, uh, you can find all of these reports on our vote by mail section. There's a number of reports that Sonny has been directing and overseeing, uh, including the voter fraud and, and other policy recommendations, the March 23rd report. Uh, but just a, a, a footnote on that, as Sonny mentioned, um, in the state of Oregon, I believe uh, there were over 2 million ballots cast in the presidential election in 2016, only 10 instances of vote by mail fraud. This is a state that is 100% vote by mail, 10 instances, and those are prosecuted. They were caught and those uh, people had double voted in Oregon and Washington or Idaho, and they were excluded. So when it does happen, there are systems in place and it is just an exceedingly rare uh, event when you look at the actual data. Um, but it is something that's important to, to think about and make sure it's secure. So uh, Chad, let me get back to you and, and get us on to a couple of other uh, legal cases that have been in the news. 
Um, Wisconsin held its election amidst this pandemic on April 7th, after the stay-at-home orders, after experts were warning against uh, grouping into crowds. And we saw these pictures in Milwaukee of limited in-person voting, people waiting in line hours. Um, yet the Supreme Court in the state of Wisconsin allowed that election to go forward. They blocked additional days or access to vote by mail. Um, can you walk us through what happened in the Wisconsin state decision? And again, this is similar maybe to Texas where there's a state holding, but then the federal Supreme Court weighed in on, on this, if I remember, just a few days before the election and said that they couldn't weigh in on this. Um, what happened in Wisconsin? Did they get those decisions right? And what does that leave us moving forward? Well, it's easy to look at Wisconsin and say, what a disaster. And, and, and there's plenty of blame to go around between the state legislative branch, its, it's governor and executive branch, the state courts and the federal courts. And it's sort of for people like us who believe in democracy and, and, and the right to vote for every eligible citizen, uh, it, I mean, there's no question the outcome was, was uh, shameful. Uh, but when, as Sonny mentions, when lawyers go into court on these cases, they are limited by what claims that they can bring. So on the state court case, what, what the argument made there was the governor had, right before the election, attempted to delay the election and otherwise adjust the process by how votes are, when they have to be turned in and when they're tabulated. And so groups of people sued in state court and immediately argued that the governor didn't have this authority. It went up to the Wisconsin Supreme Court, and the Wisconsin Supreme Court, on a deeply you know, sort of partisan, divided opinion, uh, ruled that indeed the governor had no such authority and that the election had to move forward. And stepping back for a minute, I mean, it's clear what my views are on the right to vote. Uh, there are very important questions going on in states right now, and it doesn't just have to do with voting. It's got to do with things like closing counties down, cities, school districts, uh, what regulations are, whether you got to wear a mask where you can go, how far you can travel, all kinds of things now are being decided by executive branches, uh, essentially under somebody's signature, a governor or the president's signature. And so there's a question in states whether or not their state constitution allows that. In some states, they do. The state constitution very clearly gives the governor, whatever party uh, they happen to be when they're elected, the authority during a pandemic or a disaster or a public health emergency to simply just write temporary law as is necessary. In other states, it's very clear that the governor doesn't have that authority. Texas, for example, is one of those. And what the Supreme Court in Wisconsin found is that the state's uh, constitution did not present, prevent, uh, excuse me, permit the governor to simply just change the election rules. The legislature had to do that. And the legislature had already met, discussed it, and refused to make uh, these changes. So that resolved the state case. And then, what happened was advocates went into federal court complaining that, all right, well, this election is going to go forward in a pandemic circumstances. People are essentially being asked to risk their health to go vote in person, uh, or they were required to send in a mail ballot. And for the vast majority of them, the, the, there's not enough time to do that any longer, request a ballot and vote that way. Uh, My recollection was that the, the legal issue being uh, settled or what the advocates had asked for was just more time to request vote by mail ballots, um, that by the time the existing state deadline had passed, that's when the pandemic had really started. And now suddenly a lot of people were rushing to request their mail ballot and the advocates were asking, can we have another week? Was it something like that? Exactly. They were, a they were asking to change a number of things, but they, all relative, they were all relative to giving more people time to request a mail ballot, get it, vote it, return it. The verification methods uh, uh, you know, adjusted to meet all these new deadlines for exactly the reasons you mentioned, because it wasn't the voters' fault that all of a sudden all these orders had gone into place, essentially locking down their communities to, to stop the spread of the virus. Uh, and so it was really just a common sense uh, reform uh, on rapidly changing events uh, to try to preserve democracy. And so the district court, the federal district court, granted some of this relief. It went up to the Circuit Court of Appeals and, uh, and then immediately went up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And it was the day before election day. Uh, that the U.S. Supreme Court got the case. It was the day before Election Day that, in fact, the Texas, I mean, the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled. The U.S. Supreme Court held the case, waiting, I, I presume, on the Wisconsin Supreme Court. As soon as the Wisconsin Supreme Court said, look, the governor doesn't have authority, then the U.S. Supreme Court, just a few hours later, issued its opinion. And it's a short few pages. You can go to uh, supremecourtus.gov and read the opinion. Uh, 
uh, but basically under the sort of familiar lines that we're used to seeing, the court divided 5-4 between the so-called conservative judges and the so-called liber liberal judges. And the majority opinion, uh, which was per curiam, which means it was an author, we don't know who wrote the opinion, uh, but the five justices signed onto it uh, in the majority. And it essentially said, look, it's too late. Uh, we're not endorsing that this election is happening and it's happening now. We're not endorsing that it ought to be happening the way it is. That's a separate matter. Uh, they sort of left open the door that if, in other places, if, if folks can get in front of the Supreme Court in time, they would consider claims on those issues. But the Supreme Court invoked what's called the Purcell Principle. This is a principle that, that the conservative Supreme Court has really started expanding on, I would say, in the last decade or so. And what that principle says is that once you get close to an election, the rules are in place and we shouldn't change the rules. Federal district courts and the U.S. Supreme Court shouldn't issue orders changing longstanding rules. The assumption is everybody knew the rules in advance. They had plenty of time to complain about those rules and get them changed. And here we are on the eve of the election and confusing the voters and the election apparatus is almost never justified under those circumstances. That sounds like a pretty re reasonable requirement. Indeed, uh, the Voting Rights Act used to have a preclearance regime that worked a lot that way for Southern states and other states who had intentionally discriminated against their citizens. It, it essentially froze election rules for 60 days. But like any rule, once you follow it to its extreme, it has some problems. And, and here's one of those problems. The pandemic circumstances changed everything about what was going on in Wisconsin. So saying we're gonna keep some rules that somebody put in place in many cases decades ago under a whole different uh, assumption about what human activity can look like is not an appropriate place, at least in my view, for freezing the election rules. Instead, the government needs to be ready to adjust to these dynamic circumstances like we have in nearly other area of public policy and accommodate democracy. Well, the Supreme Court evidently disagreed with that view, at least five of the nine justices did and ruled that it was too late to make any changes. Uh, and so that was that. And with that being the final word in the federal court, the Wisconsin Supreme Court giving its final word, the governor having tried to done something about it uh, and uh, having been struck down by his own court and the state legislature already meeting and deciding not to do anything, that was it. And the next day we woke up and saw all those people standing in line risking their lives for democracy. And of course, we've since learned that scores of people got the virus that day voted. That's right. If you haven't seen that already, there's been a lot of reporting out of uh, Milwaukee, as well as nationally, that um, somewhere upwards of 50 people at least are confirmed uh, were exposed that day on Election Day and voting and, and more data is tracking to see exactly what happened. Um, Sonny, let me turn back to some of the research on this uh, and how it will be implemented. Some people have asked uh, exactly how um, this might come about. And in particular, we want to make sure that there is not only uh, safeguards to make sure that the right voting, um, but uh, there has been questions now about signature matching. When you get a vote by mail ballot, uh, you sign the back of it. That signature supposedly has to match some other signature of yours that's somewhere on file. Uh, what do we know about signature matching? What needs to be improved uh, about signature matching so that if more people are starting to vote by mail, we can make sure that all those mail ballots are accurately counted? Yeah. Um, so signature matching can place a burden on younger voters, older voters, and especially voters of color um, because people obviously don't sign their names the same way twice. But for younger voters and older voters, they're getting matched against their voter registration and their signatures might have changed wildly or they might use, you know, their full name when they first signed their signature to their voter registration and now use their first initial and their last name. But also, it's because we have no cohesive or, um, you know, it's like similar way to, for counties to match signatures, even in the same state. So, for example, in Florida, you might have a county that has a provision that two people have to make sure that the signature matches. And there's all these steps, like the, the signature meets, meets, uh, meets, you know, X, Y, Z criteria. But in another county, it might just be one person who's never been trained on sign signature verification, who doesn't know anything about how to match signatures, and just says, well, I think these signatures don't really look alike, so I'm going to reject the ballot. And that happens not just in Florida, 
but in Georgia and states all across the country. And there's really no way um, to ensure that there's a cohesive way for states to implement signature verifications because counties are the election officials. Counties can create their own provisions. So without, as we advocated for, congressional action or statewide action to ensure that there's cohesive signature uh, matching standards, there's going to be signature mismatches where you see re uh, rejection rates be very high in some counties and very low in other counties. And that's gonna be the same for states like Washington that have um, staff that are trained in signature verification and in Colorado that has staff trained in signature verification compared to maybe a state that doesn't have a robust vote by mail system. So what are some recommendations uh, that you have suggested in these white papers and policy reports? How can people, if they're, uh, I guess two questions, is signature matching the only way that we can verify voters? And secondly, what happens to a voter if my ballot gets rejected? Um, do I get informed? Can I fix that? Uh, what are the next steps that county should be taking? So there, we advocate in our reports that there should be other alternative ways in addition to signature matching. So voters might be able to sign their signature, but they also can give the last four digits of their social security number. They could give um, their bank statement or utility bill with insert it within their vote by mail ballot that has their address on it. They can provide their driver's license number or passport number or even a sworn statement. In many states that have in-person voter ID, voters are able to provide a sworn statement on election day, um, signing to attest that they are who they say they are under penalty of perjury. And um, that is a fine identification in person. So we're advocating that similar ID methods might be able to be used in for vote by mail um, to ensure that signatures are not the only thing that are being used. But if you have a discrepancy, like you've just said, well, you know, my, maybe my signature didn't match. There's also wildly different things that states do to ensure that those ballots count. In some states, they don't have any method to, to notify a voter even that their, their signature was mis mismatched and their vote wasn't going to be counted. Um, other states have really expansive, um, what we call curing provisions or correcting periods in which voters will be notified by their county board of election, either by the phone, by email, by a, a mail letter, and then they're able to go in person or correct their ballot via email, fax, over the phone, and say, I am who I say I am. Here's a, a sworn statement saying, I say who I, um, I am who I say I am. And we're really modeling our caring provision off of those states that do a great job. So we say that county clerks or registrars must notify voters when their ballot is rejected, at least within 72 hours of their ballot being rejected. And this should be by telephone, email, mail, things other than a letter. And voters should be given the opportunity to not just come in in person and cure their provision. Obviously under COVID-19, we don't want people leaving their houses to go talk to county board of elections and possibly getting election administrators sick and themselves sick. So they should be able to cure these things online or over the phone. So there's, there's many different ways, but we believe also that this curing period should last until 21 days after the election day, which is what happens in Washington state. All right, good. Something a lot of people probably are thinking about, you sign that ballot and you put it in the mail and you assume it got counted, but uh, that's not the case. The research has showed a lot of these vote by mail ballots uh, are often dinged or rejected or put in some sort of temporary status. Uh, and so it is important that states and counties do a good job reaching out to a voter to make sure that those voters can cure or fix their ballots. And as Sunny outlined, a lot of those provisions are, are outlined in the uh, white papers and the reports at the UCLA Voting Rights Project. Uh, Chad, let me turn back over to you now to talk a little bit about, uh, we just have a few minutes left, the legal theories that you think we're gonna see. This probably was not the only uh, Supreme Court, federal Supreme Court decision that we'll see the Wisconsin case. We're likely to see others. What do you think, if you could sort of forecast, are the best arguments that we want to put before the courts on how all voters perhaps have a right that states should be thinking of expanding, not requiring only vote by mail, but expanding access that can withstand this legal scrutiny uh, and move forward as, as we go towards November? Well, I think you're gonna, you could generally describe the litigation as broken into two parts over this next year, really two waves. The first wave, which we've already started, is what I call the access wave. That's where we're trying to figure out 
how people are going to access the ballot in states, in many cases, as we're advocating here, that should include a lot more vote by mail. But as you mentioned, it's an all of the above strategy. You still need in-person voting. For some people, uh, voting by mail is not realistic. They don't have mail service. They have some other burdens. Uh, they need assistance with their ballot. So you're going to have to have some in-person voting. A lot of states offer what's called mobile voting and or curbside voting. You're going to need that too. As Pam Carlin said on that call we showed earlier, it, we have to treat in-person voting like we've been treating the ventilators. We've got to flatten the curve of demand for in-person voting, and it's an all-of-the-above strategy to do that. So in these access cases, I think the biggest claim is going to be the 26th Amendment claim, which guarantees the right to vote oh, for people over the age of 18. You can't abridge the right to vote based on age, that amendment says. And so in the states that have these arbitrary cutoffs that Sonny mentioned of a certain age, some places it's 60, 65, 68, uh, I think those cases are, will largely be successful in terms of gaining access. And other states that have recently eliminated various methods to vote, I think you'll see some uh, successful challenges to those. Then we'll move into a second wave of, of litigation, I expect, that will have to do with administration. And that's when uh, there'll be places that have particularly difficult uh, 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 requirements to vote by mail. One of them is the state of Oklahoma that requires you to actually get something notarized uh, to send in in your vote by mail process. And of course, that's burdensome. Most notary uh, services, all of them that I'm aware of, you have to do in person, have your ID checked and exchanged, copied. You have to sign a book for the notary and, and things of that nature. So you're going to start to see what's called Anderson verdict claims. It's part of the Equal Protection Clause claims, saying that those burdens, at least in the pandemic, are unreasonable or unconstitutional, and the states have to rest on them. And then finally, as part of the administrative part, you're going to see uh, claims about what Sonny mentioned, signature match, how ballots are received and tabulated. Those, I think, will also be under the First Amendment Equal Protection Clause analysis. But that's what I think we're about to see at the courthouse here in the next four or five months. So, Chad, as we conclude, um, what advice do you have for all of our participants and, and attendees who are watching today? How can they get involved? What can they do to um, try and... Um, take action or, or assist in this effort to make our democracy work? Well, all of us can make a difference. Um, so it, it may be as simple uh, or depending on your capacity as, as finding communities around you and assisting in their registration and you know, get your mask and do what you're comfortable with in terms of social distancing, but go out and help folks uh, fill out voter registration cards, get them delivered for them, help them get their vote by mail ballots, that sort of thing. If you've got legal skills, you should contact you know, nonprofit organizations, political parties in your state, uh, but also the ACLU and NADA, LULAC and all these other events. Uh, so, and then of course you can support organizations that are doing this fight. UCLA VRP uh, can use you know, both in-kind and, and contributions at this point. You can reach out to the Luskin School about that, uh, but there's something for everybody for, to preserve our democracy. All right, thank you, Chad. And um, we've been uh, fortunate to also be joined now uh, by Wendy Gruel, uh, who's going to um, leave us with some closing remarks. Thank you, everyone, for watching this webinar. Uh, the summit will continue with virtual sessions once or twice a week between now and mid-June. Uh, but before we sign off, I want to introduce Wendy Gruel, former LA City Council member and controller. She is a member of the Board of Advisors of the Luskin School of Public Affairs and part of the committee that helped bring this uh, webinar together. Uh, thank you, uh, Wendy, for your leadership and support, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and, and thank you to all of our panelists today and those of you that are joining our virtual Luskin Summit. We're, we're glad to be able to connect with you despite the extraordinary circumstances we all face. As mentioned, I'm a proud member of the Luskin Sum School of, of Public Affairs Board and chairing the Luskin Summit and impressed every day with the impactful work of the faculty and students at UCLA Luskin. We hope that you will become even more informed of the pressing needs of our Los Angeles County and come away with ideas and solutions and action steps to help on these issues. Please be on the lookout for a post-event survey. We greatly appreciate your feedback on these sessions and hopefully you'll let us know topics you'd like to address in future events. I invite you to continue your engagement with the Luskin School through attending future events, hopefully in person, uh, supporting our faculty and students, or sharing our great work with others in the community. 
please be our advocate so we can further solutions for the issues that we discussed uh, today. We have created an emergency fund to support students who are experiencing financial hardship that adversely affects their success at UCLA. A UCLA uh, Luskin board member has funded a match and we greatly appreciate uh, their support. We appreciate the support of our community partners who generously sponsored this series today and the future series you will see. Thank you so much to our dedicated Luskin board members who served on the planning committee. And thanks again for joining us and have a, a wonderful day. And we hope that you can attend the next Luskin Summit session and please help us make Los Angeles a, a even greater. And you see on, the, um, on your screen the information for the Student Emergency Fund and hope that you will support that. Thank you again, look forward to seeing you.